Thank you for letting us interview you. The Atlanta Historical Society is doing an oral history project of World War II veterans and others who are part of other services such as Red Cross. Your interview will be filed in Atlanta and in the Library of Congress. Start with your name, address, age, and birthday, what service you were in, why you joined that service, experiences you had, and how the war changed your life. You will have an hour and a half to speak, and I'll wave my hand when you have a half an hour left. If I have a question, I'll wave my hand. I'm Alex Glustrom. Today is Saturday, oh, and this is the beginning of the interview with Walter Cohen at his home, the friend of my grandparents. You can begin. Well, my name is Walter Cohen. Uh, what else do you want to know? And uh, just, just age our, and birthday. Yeah, age and birthday. I'm, and what uh, service? 80 right? years old. My birthday is January 12, 1924, and I was in the Air Force. Um, I was a pilot in World War II. And you asked how I happened to get into the Air Force? Yeah. It was entirely involuntary. Uh, when I was a freshman in high school, or rather a freshman in college, uh, Pearl Harbor came about December 1941. And uh, as soon as Pearl Harbor happened, all the recruiters came to the schools and they were offering deals to everybody. Where were you in college? I was at the University of Pennsylvania, my first half of my uh, college year. And they offered me a deal and they said that uh, if you sign up to become a pilot, we'll let you finish college four more years, and then you'll give us two years of service after that. Well, the fact is that I had never been in an airplane, I had never seen an airplane, I had no desire to fly an airplane, I never made model airplanes, but it sounded like a pretty good deal. Because, I mean, four more years of college and I would be through with it and then I would go into the Air Force. So I listened to the government and I signed the papers. And as to what happened, two months later, I was pulled into the service. So, you know, they were lying a little bit in those days, too. So how did you feel when, you first, when they first told you that you were going to be going into the service? Well, I told them, oh, no, I was surprised. Yeah. <laughs> because I expected to have four more years of college. Right. And uh, I was really surprised, but at that point there was nothing to do about it. Right. In those days, uh, they needed pilots very badly, and they rushed us through, and uh, so it ended up that I became a pilot. Never had any thoughts about it before mm -hmm. that. Uh, started out uh, in Miami Beach, they housed us all in those little hotels down on 3rd Street, 4th Street. We stayed there for about a month or two, uh, just marching up and down and singing songs. And I guess they didn't, weren't sure what they wanted us to do. Then we went to the University of Florida and uh, stayed there for a couple of months. And then uh, went to the San Antonio Aviation Cadet Center in San Antonio and stayed there for a couple of months. And from there we went to flying training. So we started out in uh, El Reno, Oklahoma which happens to be a very cold place in the wintertime. It's very windy, no buildings around there. And from there, we went to basic training in uh, Garden City, Kansas. After that, we went to advanced training in Altus, Oklahoma, which is right outside of Oklahoma City. Uh, from there, what happened now? From there, I went to uh, school that trained navigators. And we had to fly the navigators around so they could practice their navigation. But it really was very dangerous because they didn't know where they were going. <laughs> now, whenever we went, we had to keep track of what was on the ground so we'd get, a, get back because we couldn't depend on the student navigators. But I survived that. And from there, I went to uh, C-47 school and got checked out on C-47s and then was told I would go overseas. So that was a pretty exciting time because in those days, uh, the airplane that we flew, C-47, was a very reliable plane, but it only could stay in the air eight hours. Had enough gasoline for eight hours. And the time it would take to get to Hawaii, which was our first stop, was 16 hours. So <laughs> that's a logistics problem there. But what they did was they just put three of us on the airplane, and put in extra 800 gallons of gas, which gave us 1,600 gallons of gas, which was just enough for 16, 16 hours of flying. 
But in those days, there was no navigational equipment and none of the aids that you have now. All we had was one ship in the middle of the Pacific that sent out a beep. And uh, Pacific's a pretty big place. And if you missed Hawaii, which is like a dot, mm -hmm. uh, you, you'd be a goner. So uh, at the end of uh, 15 hours, we really started to get worried because we hadn't seen any land or anything. But uh, finally, at 15 and a half hours, we had 30 minutes of fuel left. We got to Hawaii. And uh, they put us up. At that time, Waikiki Beach, there were only three buildings on the whole beach, and three hotels, nothing else, all what, empty land. What year was this? 1942. But uh, now it's a concrete jungle. Yeah. But uh, uh, there, there was only three buildings, and they put us in one of the buildings. And if I only had some money in those days, whatever I bought would have made me a millionaire. <laughs> but as it goes, I didn't have the money at that time. We stayed in Hawaii just for a couple, two or three days, and they told us we were going to Australia. So uh, we flew a plane from uh, Hawaii, from Hickam Field, to uh, Amberley Field in Brisbane, Australia. And we got there after a day or so. And I stayed there for about uh, six months. And all we did at that time was fly personnel and cargo from uh, Brisbane, Australia, up to New Guinea, and uh, up to Townsville, Australia, and down to Sydney, Australia. It was sort of like an airline uh, job. And uh, trying to think of what happened that was sort of interesting. Uh, at one time, uh, General MacArthur was over in New Guinea, and we flew all his people down from New Guinea to uh, Sydney, Australia, so they could move their offices down. And then at one time, I had as a passenger Charles Lindbergh. He was just uh, making a tour of the Pacific to look at the our posts and everything. And at that time, he wasn't too much favored because he was a, a Nazi sympathizer. But uh, I don't think I knew about it at that time. So uh, uh, he probably would have fainted if he ever saw who was flying him around. You know, 18-year-old, 19-year-old Jewish boy <laughs> would have had a heart attack. But uh, it worked out all right. And uh, Didn't you find your cousin? Yeah, time? yeah. Well, what happened was we were flying up to New Guinea quite often. And uh, actually, uh, what happened was from Australia, I was transferred to Guadalcanal, uh, Henderson Airfield in Guadalcanal. And that was a pretty sizable airstrip. But like all of these places, all we had were the airstrips. All around us was Japanese troops. So we had to be a little bit careful. But uh, my mother had gone to a, uh, or had seen on TV, a picture of some GIs up in New Guinea. And she thought one of them looked like my cousin. So. <laughs> She wrote to, uh, I guess it was uh, Fox Movie Tone News or something in those days, and asked them if she could see a better picture of it. So they had a special showing for her, she and the boy's mother. And she wrote me a letter and said, that's definitely him. And uh, we know that you fly around that air. See if you can find him. That's like saying, there's a guy in New York City. See if you can find him. You know, I mean, it's, New Guinea was a big place, yeah. and it was all Japanese. So I really didn't think too much about it. That when I got transferred over the Guadalcanal, I, uh, whenever I got an extra moment and had an airplane, I would go to these uh, isolated fields. And all the fields were owned by the US, but all around it were cannibals and natives and Japanese. Wow. So we would land a plane there and look around, ask, ask the guy's name and everything. And sure enough, I found, found him after about six stops. I was able to get him out of uh, New Guinea, took him down to Australia, and uh, took him down to Sydney where he took two weeks off and met a girl and eventually brought her home and got married. But uh, that was a little bit different. And uh, one of the interesting things were, because we were carrying passengers, we were never allowed to carry a parachute on the plane. It wouldn't have been fair for them to give us a parachute and not give the passengers any. So we never had a parachute in all the times I was overseas. That's good. Yeah. Wow. We used to have them in training, but never once we started flying for the Air Transport Command. And uh, I was over there for a couple of years, and uh, 
I think Roosevelt died around that time, 45, is that right? 45, 45. April. 45. So uh, they sent us home. And uh, I remember my last month overseas. It was very scary because I was an instructor. I was 19 years old at the time. And I was instructing these 18-year-old kids that had just come overseas how to fly the C-47. And it was, you had to sit in the right seat and let them bounce the plane up and down. It was really quite nerve-wracking. I mean, doing that every day, and you never know if you're going to crash because these kids really didn't know anything. So uh, finally I got through that, and uh, I went home. So when I got to California, they asked me, uh, you're from New York. If you want to fly back, we'll put you back on the military plane, and you'll uh, fly for nothing. And uh, if you don't want to fly and you want to take the train, you're going to have to pay for it yourself. I took the plane, <laughs> the train rather, the train. I was a little, I had too much there with those student pilots and everything. I figured I'd get a little ra relaxation taking the train. So it took three days in those days to get across to California, from California to New York. And that was pretty much it. And I was discharged, Fort Dix, New Jersey, and uh, never went back to college, which was a mistake, really? definite mistake, but that's the way it happened. Where were you uh, when the bomb was dropped, the atomic bomb was dropped? I believe I was uh, at Guadalcanal. What was the reaction of the troops? Oh, at that point they were very happy because it seemed like it was going to end the war and save a lot of people from being killed. I mean, uh, I, I think that it was a terrible thing, but so many people would have been killed if they hadn't done it. So, uh, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, but uh, whatever it is, it was done. and. Uh, uh, we, we didn't complain, we didn't protest. The other thing I remember uh, is the atmosphere in the whole country in that war was entirely different than it is now. And it was entirely different than it was in the Vietnam War. That time, everybody was for the war. And everybody was united, and people were getting jobs in defense industries, and guys were volunteering to go in, and the whole country was behind them. Now there's quite a separation. I mean, as far as people in favor of war, people uh, against the war, and, uh, it was an entirely different atmosphere. And when we went overseas, I mean, nobody said, we, we have to come home and get rest and rehabilitation for after six months. I mean, we stayed a year, two years, three years, whatever it took. And we never heard of the conversation that they're having now about uh, how bad it is for the boys over there. But uh, that's pretty much it. Did you feel lucky to be in the Air Force as opposed to on the ground, or how did you feel that you got in the Air Force and not as a ground troop or something? Well, I got into the Air Force because I volunteered when they gave me the deal, but I felt very, very lucky because no matter where we went, the living was so different from being in the infantry. I mean, we always had fresh food, we always had nice quarters, we always had good places to go on vacation. We were so far better off than in the infantry, so I felt very happy. In fact, uh, when I decided to go, that was one of the reasons I decided to go. I did not want to be in the infantry. Yeah. I didn't like the idea of trenches. Yeah. My, my roommate was killed his first day in battle. He was 18 years old wow. in the Battle of the Bulge. So, I mean, I'm really very happy that it was not in the infantry, and I feel very lucky. Um, how did the war change your life after you got out of the war? other than obviously you didn't go back to college. That was a big change. Yeah. I mean, it was sort of, sort of a stupid decision, and uh, particularly because I could have gone back to college for n no money. Right. I mean, it was free at that time with the GI Bill. Why didn't you go back? My parents uh, probably influenced me not to go back. My father had a business, mm -hmm. and he wanted his son to be in the business. So when What I was, was the business? It was manufacturing of clothing. And I really didn't want to do it, and uh, I found out after I went to work for him, I was right, I shouldn't have done it. So I quit after about six months, mm -hmm. and uh, then I went into my own field of work, which was selling, selling on the road, you know, traveling. In fact, uh, uh, one day, uh, my wife came out to Kansas City to visit me for the weekend, so the taxi driver driving to the hotel asked her, what does your husband do? How come you're here? She says, well, he's a salesman. So the, taxi driver said, that's a great way for a guy with no education to make a living. <laughs> and the fact is, it's a truth. I mean, uh, it really is the truth, because without an education in those days, it was pretty hard, too. But today, it's impossible. You've got to have an education. You've got to have more than a bachelor's degree. 
you have any more questions, Alice? Um, no, I don't think so. Oh. Do, you, do you get guys that can go an hour and a half? Yeah, well, um, she went almost an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And Johnny, she was in for five years. Yeah, well, yeah. I was only in for a couple of years. You see, that made a difference. Yeah. Was your rate of a fatal or your casualties high in your particular area? In my particular area, it was phenomenal. I was there for two years in the middle of the Pacific. We never had a cancellation of one day on a flight. We flew every single day, and we had no casualties. Wow. That was my particular outfit. And uh, when you flew, did you, what were you flying? Were you dropping bombs or were you carrying stuff from place to place? Carrying stuff and peel, place to place. Flew C C-47s, which is a DC-3 today, if you know what that is. It's a uh, very old airplane, was very trustworthy. I mean, I've been in that airplane where it was turned upside down wow. in a thunderstorm and nothing happened. People hit their heads on the top, but uh, outside of that, the plane was fine. Wonderful airplane. Didn't go very fast, about 140 miles an hour, that's all. But in those days, that was pretty good. It's a big difference now. Was it just uh, just random that you happened to be in cargo and not um, dropping bombs? Oh, yeah. It's just random, that's right. But it wasn't random that I right. got okay. into twin-engine planes because you had a choice of going to single-engine planes or multi-engine planes. And I decided I'd like company when I'm up there, so I wanted a <laughs> multi-engine where there's at least one other guy up there. Yeah, Otherwise, it's pretty lonesome. And uh, we had some interesting things, and a lot of guys uh, didn't come back, and a lot of it was due to the uh, quick need for pilots because they gave us dual instruction for six hours, and they sent us up alone. And some of the guys were able to get up, but they couldn't come down, so they crashed. But uh, they didn't care because they needed pilots so quickly. Uh, what was the attitude toward the Japanese? I mean, did you feel like hatred? Uh, I personally or you didn't, didn't see them really in your. Yeah, I saw them because uh, I saw a couple of terrible things. Uh, uh, I didn't have a feeling one way or the other. Uh, uh, I felt we'd been betrayed and everything, and I felt that our country was in danger. But uh, I was flying transport, and they used to bring back prisoners for interrogation from New Guinea to Australia. And I remember one time, I took about three or four prisoners back, and they were in the back of the airplane, and I was up front. And uh, when we landed, they weren't there anymore, the prisoners. So I said, what happened? He said, they fell out. Was that one of the terrible things you were talking yeah, about? Yeah, that was a bad thing, yeah, you know. I mean, nice. still, they're human beings, you yeah, know. Yeah, no, I agree. And uh, they must have just pushed them out. But, uh, Are there any more other no, questions? That's it. Thanks a lot. You do a great I'll job. give you a short one. Okay, yeah. You want to take the pictures? Yeah, I do. Um